Hi, everybody. Hello, what a nice crowd tonight. Well, this is so exciting. Um, we are going to get started. So, my name is Mara Bernstein. For those of you who I haven't met, hello. I am the Director of Synagogue Programming and Adult Education here at PAS. It is <clears throat> excuse me, a joy and a pleasure to open this event tonight. I have a lot of introductions and announcements. Um, and first I want to start with a special um, recognition of this season that we're in. Um, here at PAS, we are highlighting the rededication of our building and the rededication of ourselves to eight core values that we hold dear. And <clears throat> um, tonight in the Reading Jewish Lives program, we find that um, the value of lifelong learning is of such vital importance to us that we are highlighting lifelong learning tonight. Um, this program embodies so beautifully the opportunity to explore the many facets of Jewish experience through prize-winning biographies, including Martin Buber, which we'll explore tonight. If you have been around the synagogue for the past couple weeks, you'll know that there are all types of programming that you can participate in throughout the season, collecting different value candles, and um, each one along the way you'll symbolically pick up. At our rededication on December 8th, you'll be able to pick up an actual set of candles and light them in your home on the last night of Hanukkah as um, an illumination and celebration of this momentous occasion. So to mark the significance of rededicating ourselves to these values, I would like to start with um, a brief blessing as an intention for this night of programming. Hineni Muhan Umzuman, here I am, present and prepared to rededicate myself to the value of lifelong learning. May our words and actions make this community a kehila kedosha, a place where the sacred is encountered every day. And we say, Amen. Amen. So this is um, a wonderful way to open our program and to introduce our partnership with Jewish Lives. I want to say hello to all of the communities live streaming this uh, across the nation and um, we are so happy to have both in-person participants and remote participants in tonight's program and to formally open the 2019-20 year of reading with Jewish Lives. Um, special welcome to the Melton School of Adult Jewish Learning, the Jewish Studies and Cultural Connection in Winterset, Iowa, Beth Jacobs Synagogue in Norwich, Connecticut, Marina Bay Condos Book Club in Stanford, Stamford, Connecticut, Congregation Shari Tefila in Newton, Massachusetts, Jewish Intellect Book Club, North Miami Beach, Florida, Anshay Emmett, Chicago, Illinois, Beth L. Synagogue, St. Louis Park, Minnesota, and Congregation Beth L. Sudbury, Massachusetts. So, welcome to all of you as well. Um, Jewish Lives is an exceptional series of books about the entire spectrum of Jewish experience from antiquity to the present, and this is a partnership program of Yale University Press and the Leon D. Black Foundation. Um, the Jewish Life program thoughtfully pairs authors with subjects to create lively, deeply informed books. There have been 44 books so far, including ones on Brandeis, Van Gurion, Barbara Streisand, Freud, and many more. Upcoming books to look out for are on Irving Berlin, Theodore Herzl, Houdini, and Stan Lee. So keep an eye out for those as they come out. And we are gathered here tonight to celebrate the New York launch of one of the series' newest books, Martin Buber, A Life of Faith and Descent by Paul Mendes Floor. Tonight's program will feature Dr. Mendes Floor in conversation with Rabbi Cosgrove. We'll do a Q&A se session afterwards. Um, it will also include some questions that we've gotten from our uh, live audience elsewhere. And if you are at home and want to submit a question, uh, you can do so on Twitter by using the hashtag JewishLives. Um, I am now pleased to introduce 
Sam Lair, who's the co-chair of RPAS Adult Learning Committee, who will take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Uh, good evening. Professor Mendes Flores is a leading scholar on modern Jewish thought and Professor Emeritus of the Divinity School at the University of Chicago and Hebrew University of Jerusalem. The author of several scholarly works, he is the editor and in chief of the 22 volume German critical edition of the collected works of Martin Buber and the author of German Jews, A Dual Identity, as well as the book we are here to discuss tonight, Martin Buber, A Life of Faith and Dissent. Regarded as the world expert on Martin Buber, we are thrilled to have Dr. Mendes Flora here to celebrate the launch of this momentous new book with tonight's program. It's now my honor to introduce Professor Mendes Flora and our very own Rabbi Cosgrave. Good evening, everybody. Evening. Wonderful to see everyone here. Most of all, to see you, Professor Mendes Flor, uh, and Mazal Tov on the publication of your newest book. Uh, any night devoted to learning is a beautiful evening. Uh, for me, I'd be remiss if I didn't begin the evening by sharing what a personal joy this is uh, to welcome you back to Park Avenue Synagogue, Professor. You were here uh, for, my, dedi for my, my dedication, my, uh, what was I? Installation. Installation uh, in 2008. Uh, for those who don't know, Professor Mendez Flor was my doctoral advisor at the University of Chicago. Um, it is uh, very clear that I can say with a full heart, I would not be who I am doing what I am doing if not for you, Professor. And I apologize. <laughs> and so to welcome you here to the community, I, I will have you know that, uh, and I was schmoozing with the professor before, that when you walk out, Professor, you'll see the air conditioning is, um, was given in the name of Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Cohen, who were the parents of Arthur Cohen of blessed memory, um, a mentor of yours, um, who also wrote a, a biography on Martin Buber. And so this synagogue um, can identify a certain pedigree um, even to tonight's event, to welcoming you here. And so uh, it's in that spirit of, of gratitude and friendship and dialogue uh, that we kick off this evening and this evening of learning here in our community. Uh, Mazal Tov on the publication. Uh, Martin Buber, A Life of Faith and Dissent. Uh, I want to begin with uh, the obvious question, uh, which is, uh, tell us about this title and what is uh, inside the title, Martin Buber, A Life of Faith and Dissent. Certainly. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't begin with my saying thank you. Martin Buber um, noted that perhaps the most precious word we have in all languages is toda, thank you. So I wish to thank Elliot, uh, Rabbi Kosrov, and your community for hosting this, and all those who have contributed to this evening. So I, 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 I don't remember who, uh, all who contributed, but I, you, you'll pass it on that I say thank you. Um, regarding the title, first I should say I tend to speak softly, and should you not hear me well, just signal. Don't be embarrassed or, or shy of indicating if I'm not uh, reaching you. Alkistically. Um, I'll begin by telling a story regarding Buber. Uh, one should note before I even tell the story that uh, in the Middle Ages, both in Arabic and Hebrew and Latin, faith was a question of obedience. In the modern period, it's a question of choice. Um, the most famous articulation of that is, of course, of Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian. Uh, the notion of a leap of faith. I'm not going to do that for you. <laughs> Every time I leap, I, I trip. But nonetheless, <laughs> it, it's a metaphor. It, it, it's a decision that we, we make rather than simply yielding to a tradition uh, of uh, being obliged. 
Buber uh, tells the following story which led him to his understanding of faith. He was already in his youth a very famous individual. He wrote on mysticism and myth, gained a great rep reputation. One of his books, entitled Ecstatic Confessions, was considered one of the seminal books, one of the crucial books in development, what we call expressionism, literary expressionism. Many of the expressionist writers were beholden to the young Buber for his, for his book on ecstatic confessions. Um, and with that in mind, uh, he gained a great deal of um, admiration, adulation uh, within uh, the larger community. In July 1913, uh, 19, excuse me, 1914, a month before the outbreak of the First World War, Buber was visited by a very famous reverend, the father confessor of the Kaiser, the emperor of Germany. And he was what we now in our uh, nomenclature would refer to as an evangelical Christian. He was excited about the possibility that war would come, a redemptive, catastrophic war. You perhaps recall in apocalyptic literature, we call it apocalyptic literature, uh, the birth pangs of the Messiah, the, no, excuse me, the, birth, the Messiah will be, come to us, the advent of Messiah, would be like the birth pangs of, of giving birth, agony. I witnessed four children, or no, two, two children of my own, and four of my granddaughter, my daughter, excuse me, uh, giving birth, I hope you know, familiar, the great deal of pain before the glorious moment of giving birth. And that was used as a metaphor for uh, apocalyptic uh, redemption. So Raven Heck was, oh, it's gonna break out. He came to Buber, excited. <laughs> it's coming, baby. He didn't, that's my, my interpolation. <laughs> it was after a German, so. <laughs> However, with great excitement, and he began to quote from the book of Daniel. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, we have a, 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 an apocalyptic book, uh, the war between the forces of good and evil which will lead us to the redemptive moment. Uh, and he was citing uh, the book, The Reverend, um, with great enthusiasm, exuberance, uh, um, his vision of a war which will re lead to redemption, and of course, the redemption of the Jewish people, returning them to the land of, uh, the, of their ancient patronomy, the land of Zion. And as Buber uh, led Reverend Hechler, was much older than him, uh, back to uh, his train, Rabbi Heckman turned to him and said, tell me, Herr Buber, Herr Buber, do you believe in God? He had a sense that Buber wasn't really impressed by his enthusiasm. And Buber felt, well, oh, I can't say no, but it will voice some ambiguity uh, to lead Rabbi Heckler to believe that Buber did believe in God. Um, but Buber came home and said, why couldn't I say yes? Uh, without hesitation. And it took him two years to realize. He said he was on a train and suddenly it came like a bolt of light. And this is what he came to the conclusion. If to believe in God in the third person, that I can talk about God, excuse me. I'm, <laughs> we tend to it's okay, to, <laughs> speak like that in here. All right. God does this, God is manifest in this fashion. I don't really believe, I can't believe, but if to believe in God means to feel that you're addressed by God in the second person directly, then I do believe. So let me expand upon what Buba understands by a second person address. And that address, the second person address, is uh, first articulated in his book that we're all familiar with. And for many years I claimed to have read it, but I never read it. But I nonetheless, I and thou, uh, the most famous book of Buber's. Um, he came to express, give an articulation of what he meant by second person address. That we are addressed individually by God in various moments in our lives. So let me say something about the book. The book is strange uh, um, translation. Thou, uh, thou, who says thou today? Um, it was really a translation from Old English, of course. But those of you who are familiar with uh, German or Spanish, uh, uh, Italian, are familiar with the fact that there's two words for, for, uh, for you, a more formal you, um, in the German that would be Z, and a more intimate you, the do. It's a very simple word, not thou, but do you, you. And it's, in German, it's, as in other European languages, it's confined that do to the most intimate relationships between a parent and a child. 
between the closest of friends, the closest of friends. And when we address God, even though God is understood, Melech Olam, the king of the universe, the lord of the universe, uh, we address God um, with the simple word do. So let me say something about the word do, as it's understood by Buber. If I was speaking in a university, and you'll forgive me, that's a great sin to speak like a, a university professor, I would characterize the book I and Thou as a phenomenology of saying do. Forget a word about phenomenology, but our consciousness, our sensibilities of what accompanies us when we say do. Um, and I'll preface that by noting that Martin Buber and Franz Rosenzweig, another great philosopher uh, of, contemporary, of modern Judaism, um, which occupies a chapter in the book, um, what, what we would call good friends. Certainly in the Midwest, where I've been teaching ever since I retired from the Hebrew University, friendship is instantaneous. It compels almost <laughs> before you a wink an eye. Um, but Buber and Rosenzweig were close friends in any concept, uh, way we would conceive of friendship. They worked together in creating a new conception of Jewish education, which is, of course, reflected in your project. Uh, but they were, for eight years of friendship, still per Z. So Buber would turn to, to Rosenzweig, Z, and Rosenzweig would say Z. Uh, and at one moment, Rosenzweig, who was a very ill man, wrote a poem. And inadvertently, so he said, addressed Buber with the do. Buber was eight years older. And Buber replied, don't worry. Uh, we are now ready, after eight years of friendship, to address one another with this little word, do. Behind it is a notion of cultivating trust. Uh, and Buber, in his much later writings, noted that the Hebrew word for faith is really trust. Actually, Moses Mendelssohn also, in his translation of the Hebrew Bible, um, noted that emunah in Hebrew is best understood of trust. But it takes a long time to develop the trust, genuine trust, uh, with another human being. One of my dearest students, Jessica Brown, <laughs> reminds me I should tell you a story <laughs> about a snail. <laughs> uh, Buber notes that we all march through life protecting ourselves with armor. One of his closest friends, uh, a psychiatrist and existentialist thinker, Carl Jaspers, noted that as a metaphor, as a way of understanding what is at stake with trust, uh, by referring to a snail. A snail encases itself in armor, in a shell and very reluctantly exits the shell. And as soon as there's a shadow of a threat, creeps back into the shell. And that is true of most of us. The snail would only really exit that protect protective covering. Uh, in German, you've heard it as a shield, like a tank, uh, when there's no threat uh, that he can trust the world around him or her. Um, and only, of course, does a snail really express who he, he or she is by exiting the shell? But it takes a great deal of courage and trust. Such is the notion of faith for Buber. Now, let me just, I'm, forgive me, I'm speaking too much. No, no, but we got to get to dissent as well. Right, right. Dissent. We we're only through one word. <laughs> right. I'll give you the Jewish dimension of this uh, uh, trust. We already alluded to the fact that the Hebrew word for faith as best understood is trust. Um, Buber lived in an environment where there was a very great deal of despair. Uh, we mentioned the First World War, and there was a collapse of any hope that the enlightenment, the faith and reason, would bring us into the paradise. And we gave birth to, and you forgive me again, an academic term, um, to what we call neo-Gnosticism. The word Gnostic comes to where you're familiar with is when you say somebody's agnostic, I really don't know. Uh, but it comes from the Greek word knowledge, uh, gnosis. In the period roughly uh, when the birth of Christianity, there was a, a large movement of various expressions 
as we now call Gnostic, Gnostic movements, claiming that the world we live in is a horror. It's a mistake. Our souls should have been residing somewhere else. Uh, and Gnostics provided knowledge, arcane, secret knowledge, how to escape the agony of a life of, in, in the flesh, riddled by ultimately death, uh, uncertainty, temptation, born of our flesh, and the like. So in the wake of the First World War, there was an efflorescence of Gnostic moods, of, of, uh, a departure from any notion that the world was created and behold, it is good. Uh, Buber and his Franz Rosenzweig alike, and other Jewish thinkers, said Jews cannot yield to Gnostic anxieties. We must affirm creation. That the world is good, not only good, but very good. He told them, oh, but that takes a lot of courage because we all experience the world indeed is fractured, fraught with pain and anguish. Uh, and it cannot yield to that uh, everyday experience that leads us to doubt. We shall continue to affirm life. Such we have the expression, l'chaim, it doesn't mean to have a nice drink. It means to affirm life despite our awareness of all the difficulties that we encounter. Um, and that means trust. But trust first and foremost also with our fellow human beings. And behind uh, our fellow human beings is the presence of God. So Buber put great emphasis on our interpersonal relations as a, an expression of, of faith, religious faith. Last we come to the word thou. Um, the last, the third part of the line thou, Buber introduces God as the eternal thou, who is always there to say you. In the German, said you, but we wanted to capture the religious dimension, echo thou, although it, somehow it, it, it it obfuscates, it obscures the, uh, uh, the religious sort of everyday expression that uh, Buber uh, was concerned with. And that also brought him, if you'll be brief, <laughs> to Hasidism. Hasidism, as he understood it, was to learn to worship God in every aspect of life. Not only in the synagogue, certainly in the synagogue, but when you go to Fifth Avenue or worse, <laughs> uh, worse, I don't know, worse, because I just had a meal of <laughs> $50 for a little sandwich, I can't believe it. How do you manage? Well, welcome to the Upper East Side. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, to serve God in the everyday of all its difficulties and disappointments. Um, and it does encourage and demand a great deal of spiritual strength to affirm life of our fellow human beings. Um, especially this guy, I don't know if I can get away with this, but especially in the age of Trump, <laughs> that you'll forgive me for that. <laughs> uh, anyway, you know what I was trying to say. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, and so, this, so just to, to build on this, Professor, and this, you know, I, the book is a biography, but his theology and, and philosophy are all, are all intertwined, which raises a question of the degree to which one's theology recapitulates biography. And this really comes out in the first few chapters of a young boober who is abandoned by his mother, raised by his grandfather, who's a man of both means and Jewish learning. He marries out of the faith, keeps that relationship a secret from his grandfather, I believe, as well as the birth of his children. So really a, a very uh, complicated biography, uh, certainly in his early years. And he comes out with this notion of dialogue, of mm. the potentiality of intimacy uh, with another human being. And, and I don't know, I'm, I don't want to be an armchair psychologist here, but the, to the degree that one's emergent from the other. I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, uh, as a, a noted, and you perhaps have already read the book, or when Buber was a, a child of three years old, three years, 
His mother suddenly abandoned the family, eloped with a Russian lieutenant, and the young Buba ran to the uh, window, a little balcony, and waved, and his mother turned around to acknowledge that waving. To the very end of his life, he died at the age of 86, the pain of a mother who abandoned him r remained as chiseled in his soul, lacerated his, his very being. That, I surmise, um, rendered human relationships that much more important. A very good friend of mine in Jerusalem, um, well, he actually lives in Herzliya. I live in Jerusalem. My home is actually in Jerusalem. Um, um, a poet of renown uh, notes in his poetry that the one love that we have that really remains firm is that of a mother. Of a, mother. a mother's love is unconditional. All other loves you have to renegotiate, um, ideally, of course. Um, he lacked that. Uh, he sought, well, this I mentioned in the book, when he finally yielded to the, um, the, um, to the gestures of, uh, of his future wife, he wrote a love letter, a very unusual love letter. At least I would find it. He said, I have the first acceptance of a love, he concluded by saying, now I realize what I am missing in my life. A mother. Imagine writing a love letter. <laughs> I, you're my mother. <laughs> but that's um, the maternal warmth and support that he gained from his wife was of uh, overarching significance. But it also meant that he was aware of how fragile relationships are, uh, how often you can be abused by reaching out to the other, misunderstood. So he even created a word Sounds in German, it's vergegnung, means a mismeeting. Most of our attempts to reach out to others are periled by mismeetings. But that became his overarching concern, and it became a question of faith, not to yield to despair. Um, one of uh, Buber's disciples, a great Jungian psychologist, Menem Eric Neumann, of the, uh, perhaps the most um, um, Cherished pupil of Jung wrote a book called The Great Mother, which echoed that, those concerns. Um, motherhood is the source of, of, um, of life. We make it very strong in Hebrew and Arabic by chance. You know, the Hebrew word for, for compassion comes derived from the Hebrew, the word for womb. Rachmanut is a Rachmanus, we perhaps say in Yiddish, uh, derived from the Hebrew word Rechem, which is the womb. Um, that was ruptured, and perhaps ruptured to all of us at one level. Um, but how to restore the warmth, the security of the womb? Uh, oh. um, and so, I, to, so to that degree, there's a direct connection between his... I believe his, so, yeah. You know, you know as another, forgive me a little lesson. Um, I'm an incorrigible teacher. I, you know, I once brought my daughter when she was nine uh, to the university, in Hebrew University, and she wanted to know what her father does. So she came home after attending my class, and mother said, her name is Inbal. Inbal, how is that's teaching? She goes, I'll say in the Hebrew, mom. I said, Abba Milamed Shtoyot, dad teaches nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> she got it right, but none of this. <laughs> but nonsense with big polysyllabic words and such. <laughs> However, let me just say, I forgot what I want to tell you. What, what did I want to say? <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot what I want to say, but probably, Probably was nonsense, <laughs> All right. Well, so th this intimacy that Buber uh, writes oh, of. I now remember, excuse me, forgive yes. me. <laughs> There's a, a German word that's derived from the word to give birth. It's called Geborgenheit. You probably know the term. It means warmth, security, um, and in some sense, I think Buber sought Geborgenheit, which was deprived of him as a child. Um, but we can create in our relationships that Geborgenheit um, and to render the world in which we live, God's creation, as Geborgen in that sense. Please. So of all of the, the tools within the Jewish toolbox by which someone can access this intimacy with the divine, uh, Buber 
uh, wrote, uh, I, I believe, the categories of, of Torah to, one's relationship to a sacred text, Amo, one's relationship to a sense of peoplehood, um, and Atzmo, uh, the, the self. The, the, the self. Um, missing in that is mitzvot. Missing in that it's mitzvot. And there's an entire chapter in your book on Buber's relationship with Rosenzweig and their give and take on the matter of whether mitzvot are or are not um, a means by which to give expression or, in, in, well, this is Heschel's word, the, the leap of faith. Uh, and and it, it strikes me that Buber had a disdain for rabbinism. And I'm wondering if you could give, uh, paint a picture of how this thinker who had such affection for all these other tools of Jewish expression, the idea of mitzvot just didn't do it for him. Right. Well, first, uh, uh, mitzvah, of course, means command. Um, um, and for Buber, God's commandments are not restricted, not confined uh, to ritual act actions. Um, he, was, um, he was a member of a generation, a child of a generation, that came to a conclusion that what led to the outrage, the horror uh, of, of the First World War and the collapse of the dream of the Enlightenment, that reason will bring us together, create a new harmony between human beings, um, was the separation of worship from the everyday. Uh, and he was joined with that view or that perception with Sigmund Freud. You read Sigmund Freud's works on the, on the First World War, brilliant. Uh, and it comes to a similar conclusion. We teach our children not to steal, not to be angry, not to uh, be deceitful. And when you look at the politics that led to the First World War, we steal, we kill. And that dissonance uh, was a, a profound tragedy, and a tragedy that perhaps we still are uh, uh, alert to. Um, emerging from that Buber's uh, concern, together with people like Paul Tillich and others, I'm just throwing out a name, so forgive me, um, but very eminent individuals, is that we have to bring God out of this, not God into the everyday, into public life, not to limit God to um, this, the synagogue or church, mosque. Um, and so God, to recognize that God uh, has mitzvot that should be heard in the everyday world. Um, and again, he's inspired by the Hasidim in that respect. Um, more biographical, he was, when he was three years old, his father didn't know what to do with a child who has been abandoned by a mother and he by his wife. So he's dispatched young Buber to live with his grandparents, Orthodox Jews. His, father was, his grandfather was a great scholar of Midrash. Uh, his grandmother still wore a shaitel, you know, a wig, being from a Hasidic family. Very observant, but they failed to address Buber's agony. He says, my, I ask questions, he says, Shh, don't worry about it. Um, all they gave him was a regiment of Orthodox observance, which didn't allow him to, to come to terms with his sense of loss. He found the orthodoxy of his grandparents, whom he loved, to be oppressive. As soon as he went to the university at the age of 18 uh, in Vienna, he, he abandoned everything Jewish. And later on, he found his way back to a Jewish identity, Jewish involvement in Zionism. But here's where the sense becomes in. Uh, Zionism was a form of nationalism. That doesn't really satisfy, particularly Herzl's brand of, of, uh, of Zionism. It's an answer to anti-Semitism but he was concerned about the spiritual substance of Jewish life. Um, and therefore, he um, eventually broke with Herzl. He returned to Zionism uh, later in his life out of a sense of solidarity of the forlorn people, um, solidarity with his fellow Jews, which he never gave up, although he was clearly dissatisfied, critical of the way Zionism had uh, emerged. Um, and that's his dissent. He was very, but the British have a notion of the loyal opposition. <laughs> he remained in a loyal opposition, emphasizing that Judaism cannot be confined to an ethnic identity or a political identity. Um, our vocation 
is our vocation as Jews is spiritual, not quite ethical. I mean, it's ethical, of course, but it's the spiritual dimension of being an ethical human being. Um, there's mitzvot that, that, that cannot simply be confined to the synagogue. Although he certainly honored those who, like his best, his closest friend was a man named Agnon, uh, the great uh, noble, uh, the great Hebrew author and noble laureate, uh, who was an observant Jew towards the end of his life. Very, uh, and they, um, if, if you read the book, the very end of it, something very touching. Um, I had the, the privilege of knowing, I didn't know Martin Buber, but I knew his, his family, his son, his, uh, his daughter to a lesser extent, the grandchildren, the great, 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 great grandchildren. Um, and the great granddaughter who was raised in, within Buber's home uh, together with her parents um, noted that when Buber was on his deathbed, um, she ran home, she was 15 from school to see her grandfather, our great grandfather. Uh, and she found him uh, in his last grasp uh, with his hand in that of Agnon. Um, so he certainly honored those who observed. Agnon felt that his way to faith and to Jewish expression was in through the synagogue, the mitzvot as classically understood. Um, but his concern was to have us reach out beyond the synagogue to the everyday, the way we make politics. Yeah. So you, you touched on Buber's Zionism. Yes. So I wanna pivot to that because both Early on in his career, his engagement with and then disillusionment uh, with the nationalism of Jewish peoplehood. And then, of course, post-1938, as a refugee or as a, an arrival uh, in uh, pre-state uh, Israel in the Yishuv. And, uh, and he... His, di his uh, philosophy of dialogue um, was front and center in terms of informing his views on uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I'm wondering if you could uh, give us, uh, is there a thread to Buber's relationship to Zionism or are there different discrete chapters, different points of his life? Could you, could you speak to Buber's relationship to Zionism? Yes. I've already noted that uh, the fundament of Buber's Zionism is uh, solidarity with his fellow Jews and a very critical moment. The, the rise of ferocious, uh, barbaric anti-Semitism um, in the 20s and of course then went for, uh, in the, with the rise of the Third Reich. Buber remained in Germany uh, that period as was often referred to as the shepherd of German Jewry. I've, traveled throughout Germany in those conditions to uphold the, um, uh, the faith. And that for Buber was, as was suggested, by affirming our Judaism through learning, uh, learning texts. Um, not simply saying we're proud to be Jews, but we are um, spiritually engaged in the heritage of Judaism. So teaching, learning, you know, this, this in, in, in German and Hebrew, we, well, you should make a distinction between study, what you do in the university. You have to go to the Hebrew University, Hebrew, well, less than the Hebrew University, but University of Chicago, go to the library, everyone's like this with the nervous legs. <laughs> it's like an advance. Uh, and then you're examined, then you're a subject to the, uh, the, the critical evaluation you have teachers and the like. It's brutal. It's not an I, My children don't go to, didn't go to the university. I would send them to the university. They're artists, they're creative people, but I would never send them to torture. But they do study. I'm exaggerating a bit, but nonetheless. Uh, but uh, Judaism talks about learning, and learning is a very different activity than study. You learn in the community. You learn and also have to be spiritually and intellectually edified, not to garner a degree, but to somehow create a spiritual uh, universe. Um, and that's what Buber uh, sought to give German Jewry in those dead, uh, perilous hours until he was eventually, um, the, the, the Nazis who, super, uh, who s kept him under surveillance forbade him to teach. And then he finally emigrated to Israel. 
I should say, we make a kind of flow. It's the state of Israel. Israel and Jews everywhere. Those who live in Manhattan are Israel. Those who live in wherever, in Norway, are Israel. Uh, it's the state of Israel. And it's a, a, unfortunate that we tend to collapse the term Israel. Israel is it's the state of the, of the Jewish people, of Israel. And Israel, of course, is, is a religious concept, not just the Jewish people. It's a religious concept. Um, um, the children of the covenant are not simply an ethnic group that has history, etc. cetera, the, uh, the Jews. Um, and that was important to Buber. Um, but with respect to the Palestinians, he noted that in Europe, the so-called uh, Jewish question, and let me just give you a quick lesson. Um, forgive me, I'm certain you know what I'm saying better than I have to say. Um, with the emancipation and the enlightenment, was questioned, can we really include the Jews within this new polity, liberal, the liberal world? And there was hesitation. And not just amongst the riffraff, Hegel, Kant, all the great philosophers participated. What would really qualify the Jews to participate as a fellow citizens? After all, they're a strange Asiatic people. Uh, and that gave birth to the Jewish question. Finally, well, finally is the wrong word, but ultimately, Hitler said, I have the solution that we've been searching for for 150 years, a final solution, an absolute so solution to the Jewish question, to eliminate him. So Buber, reflecting on that before the, ultra, the ultimate hour of the final solution, noted that the Jewish question that, that, that haunts Europe is ultimately a Christian question. It's a test of the resolve of the Christians or to bring the sources of their faith to acknowledge and honor the Jewish people. In a similar fashion, an analogous fashion, the so-called Arab question is ultimately a Jewish question, whether we have the resources, the intellectual, spiritual, and ethical resources to solve our conflict with the Palestinians. And that cannot be solved simply by political uh, maneuvering and, and the like. Uh, we had a fancy term called realpolitik. You know, acknowledging the world is brutal. No. Uh, we are beholden by a spiritual heritage to seek uh, somehow living with honor and dignity uh, with our neighbors, our cousins, if you wish, uh, the Arab peoples. And he never yielded that hope and that resolve. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, I mean, I could, I could actually keep speaking to you all night, but uh, the, uh, the amazing thing about Buber uh, is, well, there are a lot of amazing things, but from his earliest years, his Hasidism, his uh, I and Thou, his, his other, he, he's also, I mean, he lived till 1965. Uh, and in that sense, he's also a post-Holocaust theologian. Right. And I'm wondering, uh, did, did Buber, if we think about that whole school of responses to where was God um, in, in the gas chambers, uh, to what degree, uh, and can, can you tell us how Buber, especially given his background, um, responded? Did he have a response theologically yeah. to the Shoah? Yes, he did. Actually, um in the, thir uh, the 1940s, where the leadership of the Zionist community felt a certain distance from the Holocaust, the Jews were, who, left in, who, who le were left in Europe were like sheep going to slaughter. And they were embarrassed and associated with Ben-Gurion and others. Buber was a member of a group that called Aldomi, which means do not keep quiet. We have to acknowledge the pain of our fellow Jews. Uh, and he was amongst the very first and gave a lecture here in, uh, I, I don't know if it was a synagogue, but New York City in Manhattan in 19, uh, 1950, in which he spoke about, the, the, addressed the question of Auschwitz, faith after Auschwitz. Perhaps one of the first articulations of that concern. Um, he also spoke about the eclipse of God. Um, you know, like a sunset, but if God is eclipsed by our um, rush to be bombed to be successful in a material world of achievement and the like. We've somehow 
blurred vision of God, or maybe left God to certain moments that we call sacred life. But in terms of everyday life, God has somehow been eclipsed. Um, and the challenge is somehow echoing his fundamental faith is this, to be attentive to God in, in every aspect of our lives. But it's interesting because he, he himself struggled with giving a full-throated faith in a God actively involved in our affairs earlier. Um, and then to what degree right. that earlier boober that you described yeah. a few moments ago informed the later boober after Auschwitz. Yeah. If I just can correct you, forgive me for... <laughs> you, you corrected me for about eight years of my life. You can keep but, doing it. I shall. <laughs> uh, you said God is actively engaged in our lives. This question is how we are actively engaged with God in our lives. Um. Got it. Okay, so let's... Uh, um, open it up and uh, give everyone a chance to ask a question or two before, uh, so uh, let's, do we have, Mara, do you want to come in and uh, uh, do we have, okay, so we have uh, over here, yeah, yeah, but let's, uh, the, Lindsay will bring the microphone over and you can make a Brief statement ending with a question mark. It's interesting. I really have two questions. Yeah, maybe uh, just to be was very the spirit of Boober coming <laughs> in your name. I was wondering. Your name. My name is Sylvia. Sylvia. I'm Paul. Okay. <laughs> That's an Indian. <laughs> right, I, I wanted to just ask, how would it be so easy then with Boober to would it move? It's so easy to move towards universalism. How does it? How how can we hold on to the Judaism part? Right. In terms of following Buber, that was one question. I, and then the other, I just want to, that the ich and do, does that necessitate, necess, does one need a partnership for that? Because what if I'm an ich and do, but the other person is, is not? So where does that, okay. I don't yeah. know. So I just, for the purposes of the, the recording, Sylvia, thank you. I'm going to re repeat both I'm questions. Sorry, yeah. No, no, they were both uh, well, well taken. Uh, number one is why uh, how, what, the, the slippery slope to universalism and the degree to which Buber negotiated this particularism and universalism. Mm -hmm. And number two is um, I and thou is all very nice, but uh, what, if, what if the other party doesn't feel the same way right back? I think that's You're right. more or less. They're excellent questions and actually uh, hit at the heart of, our, of, our, of Buber's challenge to us. Uh, God created the world. You know, I was, let me just slip back. The favorite prophet of Buber was Amos. Uh, and Amos, if recall, says, says the Israelites, I'm not only your savior, I'm the savior of the Ethiopians and other peoples. Uh, he reminds Israel that Amos, Amos, yeah, you say Amos, not Amos, Amos, uh, um, of the universality of God. So, uh, and if you read I and thou, Buber only mentions three Jews. You know who they were? Jesus, Peter, and Paul. Not me. I mean, that would be... That would, <laughs> that would, you, just, you would be a true prophet. No, no, no. no. That's why you earned a doctorate from me. <laughs> no. However, um, it's a universal statement. And Buber's understanding, as you correctly note, uh, affirms the universality of God. So what's specific about Jewishness, uh, or Buber's Jewishness? It's the witness that we are, um, that we give. And the Hebrew Bible in particular, Buber understands as a dialogue. God spoke and we listened. Uh, it's difficult to listen. You know, we make a distinction, we should make a distinction between hearing, we hear what others say, but to really listen to what they say is much more difficult. And that's the way Buber interpreted the Hebrew Bible. Often Israel, the people of Israel, just heard God and then did whatever they, <laughs> whatever they sought to understand by God's word or ignored it. Uh, the challenge was to listen. Um, and the literature of Israel, beyond the Hebrew Bible, gives expression to the challenge of affirming uh, a God of 
creation. Um, theologically, we say Buber is a creational theologian. His theology is not simply um, individual salvation, but uh, um, firmly grounded in creation. Uh, and to render the world has really a uh, witness to God's goodness. And that's the challenge. Um, so it's a universal God, but Israel has a specific uh, a contribution to articulating, to clarifying um, that um, the universality of God. In one of his last essays, Buber addressing the Arab Israeli question, he said, Are we still the children of, of Amos? And he said in Hebrew, Amos question mark. Are we still the children of, of Amos? Thank you. Um, and the second question was uh, the question of uh, oh, yes. and of the asymmetry, asymmetry of relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mutual trust has to be cultivated. Uh, we often reach out to the other, and the other person is not really with us. Um, and that's what makes dialogue so difficult. Um, it's not simply um, I smile and you smile in response. It's learning to, uh, to really listen to one another deeply. Let me just say something about listening. Um, what brought Buber to understanding the distinction between hearing and listening. Listening is not only uh, a question of hearing in the auditory sense. And he told the following. I mean, when he was still a very famous man, before he came to the notion of dialogue, um, people often sought him out. As you turn to famous people, he asked for their signature and the like. Uh, or he wanted to have an exchange with them regarding some arcane academic issue. Um, but one day, uh, in the midst of the First World War, a bedraggled soldier came knocking on the Buber's door six in the morning. Can you imagine somebody knocking on your door six in the morning? Uh, Buber was already at his desk. Uh, he saw the man was in great distress. He says, well, it is a bit early, <laughs> um, but do come in nonetheless. And this bedraggled soldier said, I came watching all the way from the Austrian front. Buber was at the time living in the, east, in the western part of Germany. Um, I came by foot to ask you a question. I was, please, ask the question. Uh, and the signal that he, he only had a half hour, he took out his, 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 his watch, you know, a little, what do you call it? No, uh, pocket watch. watch. Pocket watch, yes. But very gently, but he, <laughs> the signal was, <laughs> have a half hour to give you, which is very generous. Somebody come at six in the morning. Uh, and Buber said, he, he said, please, the man asked all the quests, some, some questions, and Buber said he was very polite, cordial, and answering those questions. The following day, Buber learned that this man committed suicide. And he realized that he failed to really listen to the true questions, the questions inscribed in the forehead of that individual, not those necessarily articulated through speech. Um, and that's the challenge of dialogue. And it's an extraordinary challenge. And you're right. Um, uh, this man came to Buber hoping that Buber would be open. This is before Buber realized what the challenge of dialogue. And he wasn't. Um, and throughout one's life, we reach out to others hoping they would exit their shell, you know, the snail image, and they don't. Um, and that's what makes faith such an onerous challenge. It's not just simply a declaration of faith. It's a life of faith. Um, and it's, it can be, it is extraordinarily difficult, but we cannot yield as Jews. And of course, our fellow men and, human and women are also urged to have that faith as well. Thank you. Take another question. Please. Um, Yes, uh, well, Lindsay, we have three in the middle, so let's... Uh... No, he said two questions. Uh, I'm going to amend that in the Jewish tradition, four questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, I was reading the, uh, the uh, biography of uh, Rabbi Schneerson, and... He, reading the biography? Can you hear me? Yeah. He wasn't reading your biography, he was reading the biography of uh, Schneerson. Schneerson, oh, yeah. oh, the seventh yes. uh, Rebbe. And uh, here's a man who loves everyone in the world, every Jew, whether it's orthodox or not believing, 
There's one Jew he didn't really like, and that was Martin Buber. And despite the fact that uh, he did a lot to bring uh, Hasidism and the tales into the forefront, do you have any insight into why? Uh, 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 didn't like Buber uh, or regarded him yet. Well, I think precisely what was alluded to before is that Buber didn't uh, urge us to, to the ritual mitzvot. Um, but the uh, question of love is a very challenging notion. To love, it sounds like it's a big word, and we all have um, a sudden understanding of love and how crucial it is in our lives. Um, you know, uh, again, a brief academic note. We have two terms in Hebrew uh, for love, or two instances of love. Uh, and one is referred to as we should love God with all our might and such. Uh, that's technically, we call it in technical grammar, grammar accusative. You, you love God with, with no inhibitions. But when God's, when we're in the Bible, it speaks about love of our neighbor, love of the strangers. It's a different grammatical form. And that love is not simply passionate love, um, as we would perhaps allow for ourselves with regarding God, especially Hasidim have a very ecstatic relationship to, to the divine, ecstatic love. Uh, but the love of the neighbor, the love of the stranger, is what we would call carative love, caring for them. You don't have to love your neighbor. You can find the neighbor vile, repugnant, and yet we're beholden to love the neighbor. You may say the same thing. The stranger in our midst may be uh, our adversary, and yet we're still challenged to love uh, the stranger. Why? Because we seek love as well. We want to be loved uh, by our neighbors and in, where, in, this is in circumstances where we're, we are strangers, as we were in Egypt, as we perhaps were elsewhere in Europe, um, throughout the world, we're strangers, we want to be loved. But it's a different type of love, not ecstatic love, uh, but it's a love of caring, of being attentive uh, to the other, even though you're not really like them. <laughs> uh, um, and I think that's missing in, in, uh, in, in forgive me, uh, in uh, Schneerson's understanding of love within this particular expression or articulation. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for a couple more questions. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh. oh, sorry. Hello. Thank you very much for your fabulous book, which really made it possible to begin to understand this unique individual. Thank you. But my question has to do with the effect of Rabbi Nachman yes. on Buber, because of all of the Hasidim, he seemed to be more influenced by Nachman than any of the other rabbis. All right. So the question, just to repeat, is the influence of not just Hasidut in general, but Rabbi Nachman yeah, the and the tales of Rabbi Nachman <laughs> yes. as well. Actually, the first book that Buber wrote on Hasidut was Rabbi Nachman. And of course, he told us that there's so many ways of, of serving God. The very famous one is if you go to a rabbi and just observe how he, he ties his shoes uh, with a certain sense of, of sacredness. Um, and it's true, it's, you know, we learn by the exemplars in our lives. Um, and that's what Buber also sought. Not just people who are very learned. In fact, those who are very learned tend to be the most <laughs> difficult people. <laughs> uh, uh, but even simple people have the, the nobility, that, the spiritual nobility uh, that, can, that should not only instruct us, but inspire us. And that's what Rabbi Nachman told us, taught us. But you've been asking. Will you allow me to yes, recognize? Uh, of course, we just <laughs> want the mic. We just, uh, let's get them. We have another question right here. Yeah. Thank you. Did Buber eventually meet his mother, had relationship, or never? And second question, what became of his children? Yes, Buber's children. Buber's, uh, Buber's children. children, yes. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, when the children were ready, uh, in his, his, did he ever meet his mother? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. You no, know, yes, uh, yes. He, um, when his children were teenagers, they did have an occasion to meet the mother, 
And he said he couldn't look her in the eyes. He couldn't. He no. couldn't look at her in the eyes. You know, he just felt deeply betrayed. Uh, but that was the only, the only time that he didn't meet her. Uh, he wanted his children, to, her, his children to know her, um, but it was very difficult for him. Um, and Bubis' children, yes, he had two children. Um, um, Ava, was, well, the first son is Raphael, which was named after an uncle of Bubis who fell off a horse and died. So Raphael means God will heal. Um, that was his first child, and then uh, a year later, Ava was born. Um, and both uh, emigrated to the state of Israel, uh, actually Palestine and the state of Israel. Um, I was particularly close to Raphael uh, Buber. And let me just, perhaps this goes back to one of your questions. Raphael told me that his father told him, Raphael, whatever you do in life, you can be a shoemaker, you can sell cigars, but do it with integrity. Uh, he didn't urge his children to have an academic career, um, but just to have integrity uh, in whatever they do. And so is Raphael. Raphael studied um, agricultural machinery in order to be a member of a kibbutz in the 1920s and 30s. And that's what he did. Um, when uh, his father passed away, Raphael was given, had the responsibility for the, uh, the literary and uh, and financial estate of his grandfather, of his father, excuse me. Um, and that's who he came to me. He, one aspect of his father's writings that he understood, because he was not an academic, <laughs> was his father's engagement in Arab, Arab uh, Israeli or his Arab Jewish relations. And his father wrote a great deal about uh, those questions, but he wanted somebody who had an academic approach or credentials. And it was recommended, I was recommended to him. And we became uh, very close friends for 15 years. This, some of you may know the German custom of Abendbrot, four o'clock tea. Some, some of the British have it, something like that. Every day for 15 years, I was invited to uh, Raphael's Buber's home for Abendbrot. Um, and he told me a great deal about his parents, of course. Um, and he would call if I didn't make it, and my daughter said, Oh, once again, Raphael Buber's calling you, right? <laughs> um, but uh, his children were, in their own way, um, um, devoted to his, his um, legacy. Thank you. So uh, we're, do we have time for la last question? Last question. Well, I'm, I'm going to save the last question because I'm running the program. OK. <laughs> Hi. Rabbi's prerogative. <laughs> I'm Abby Eisenberg. Thank you. I have two questions. So Please. if you'd like to just answer one, that's OK. Um, you said that the Jewish question was actually a Christian question. But that question, the Jewish question arose, you were referring to the modern era in nation states. So I was wondering if you could clarify right. that. And also, um, you said that the Arab question is really a Jewish question, and I wondered if that is Buber's articulation, or you've written about that, or others have written about that. Yeah, it's, so uh, just to repeat, to clarify the, the question about the meaning of the Jewish question, um, as well as you said uh, that the Arab question is really a Jewish question, uh, is that Buber talking, or is that Paul Mendes floor talking? <laughs> uh, or someone else. Someone else, right. You quote it in the beginning of your book. You say what Paul says about Peter says more about Paul than it does about Peter. Right. So. <laughs> I'm going to take the doctor. I already have my doctorate, so. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, the Jewish question was articulated as such already with, in the debates whether the Jews can be incorporated into the modern uh, political uh, um, structure, democratic liberal structure. Um, and it gained uh, in, uh, in uh, volume, so, uh, not volume, but voice over the, over the years, as I already indicated. 
Hitler offered the final solution to the Jewish question. Um, the very fact that Europe, still beholden to Christian heritage, hesitated to include the Jews as fellow human beings in the, or citizens, but citizens are fellow human beings. They regard them as, as, as uh, fellow human beings who qualify for citizenship, uh, according to Buber, was uh, an indication of the, of the failure of Christianity to draw upon the questions of love and the like. Um, there's lots of studies on the nature of, mo of modern anti-Semitism. Is, is it totally something new, or is it still draw upon anti-Judaism that had um, uh, um, that had been um, part of the heritage of Christianity? Um, so in that sense, it's, it's the Jewish question is could be understood as a, uh, a Christian question. Analogy for Buber was. Um, um, the Arab question. Of course, he meant that in, in a sermonic sense, in a, a way of urging us to uh, not just to consider the, our struggle with the Palestinians and Arabs in general as a p purely political struggle, but one that we would have to draw upon the wisdom of our tradition to solve in a way which honors the dignity of both ourselves and the Palestinians. So, Professor, just to close, and, uh, and you can use this as an opportunity for anything we've, we've missed out, and I encourage everyone to stick around for a few minutes because the professor will be uh, signing copies of the book uh, outside, which are for sale. Uh, you've studied Buber uh, for decades. You have a relationship with his children. You're the custodian of the literary estate. You finally wrote a biography. Um, so let me ask the question of, of relevancy or what did you learn in this endeavor of writing this book about Buber that makes him more relevant than ever right now? Uh, and maybe even it's, I don't know if it's untoward to say, but to what degree is Buber a, a, a timepiece that does not speak to yeah. the present day. You know, all we, uh, what we, so it's said that all we do academically uh, is autobiog autobiograph, uh, an autobiograph. Um, clearly writing Buber as I understood Buber, and I understand him as refracted through his writings, but also his family, which I had the great privilege, and still have the great privilege of being um, an honorary member, I guess you would say. <laughs> um, I learned a lot about myself and why Buber is important to me. Um, I do mention in the book that Buber was, um, was not a perfect human being, um, but he was, he was perfectly human. Um, and that's an important distinction. We all have our foibles, our fears, our inconsistencies, and certainly Buber had those fears. I mentioned that he had a beard. You know why he had a beard? Not to be a prophet. When he was born, the, the, uh, the forceps grabbed his lip and he had a twisted lip. And it also affected his speech. As soon as he was able in his adolescence to have a mustache, he got the mustache. I don't have that problem. I'm just, this is purely out of vanity. Nothing, I'm, nothing is noble as trying to describe, to correct me. And then her lip. Um, and began with a mustache. It was actually the lower lip. Um, you know, somehow, and then the beard, um, and somehow played into an image of, of, of a prophet, and it made him very, very uncomfortable. He didn't enjoy the role of being a prophetic image. He, re he preferred to, to, to hide amongst his books. Um, he was shy. He, he didn't have a disposition to be dialogical. For him, it was very hard. Some of us have a more open personality, but uh, he didn't, but he knew it was a challenge, and it was difficult for him. Um, and acknowledging or recognizing that his difficulty, I have learned about my own difficulties, and also my own journey as, uh, as a Jew, as a, ultimately as a human being. Um, um, so uh, what I learned is not so much about Buber, but I learned about why Buber is uh, important to me, and perhaps 
uh, important donors as well. Thank you. Um, Professor Mendes Floor, we're honored by your presence. Mazal Tov on the publication. Please join me in thanking Professor Mendes Floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone's cordially invited outside for a book signing. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm all.